something wrong with you and it happens to say <coughs> try ten times, then you're gonna use up so much energy that you yeah. you have to yeah. catch a busload of people. <laughs> Beautiful. Good, enjoying the tour? Yes, very much. Great, well, you've brought the weather with you, so yeah. congratulations <laughs> on that. Much, much better than it has been. <coughs> okay, you've introduced the, the tiger, so. Okay. We're just waiting for my colleague Steph. She's going to fetch the all important meat from the butcher room. So okay. she'll be back any minute, and then there'll be a lot of excitement. Um, we feed, feed the tigers six days a week out of seven, okay. um, which replicates the fact that in the wild they don't feed every day, they may go 14 days in between a kill, and that's not because they, they don't want to feed often like we do, it's just purely down to their ability to succeed during the hunt, and although they're apex predators where they live throughout their Asian territories, in actual fact only one out of every 20 um, attempts to kill will actually be successful. Right. Why do you think that, that it, it's such a low um, success rate? What things might impose themselves on their ability to, to kill, do you think? Uh, I suppose because the... Sorry? The wilds of the other animals. Yeah, okay, so it's uh, other animals that share the, the territory obviously are all pretty pretty scared of tigers, you know. Yeah. They're, they're the, 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 um, the main threat to their livelihood. So when tigers are out hunting, i.e. when they're not resting up and, and um, keeping out of the way, the forests... <laughs> <laughs> ...really become alive with, um, with alarm calls and, yeah. and, and other animals know yeah. that they are on the prowl and oh, look. wanting a meal. So you've got the monkeys calling and yeah. the deer calling and yeah. everyone's basically shouting, get out of the way, the tigers are coming yeah. for you. So, any other reasons why they might find it more, you know, difficult to hunt their prey or kill their prey, should I say? Um, uh, I suppose because a lot of the prey is so much faster than them. Thank you, exactly that. The yeah. tigers actually are um, designed for um, great success when they get to their prey. Yeah. The chances are, if they get to it, they're going to bring it down and they're going to kill it because they've got this extreme power. Yeah. All a lot of it really shunted to the front of their body yeah. but it's getting to the prey that's the problem yeah. not only have you got these alarm calls bursting out of the forest and prey scattering in all directions but they're not that fast comparative to their prey they run top speed about 30 miles an hour mm. you compare that to the cheetah that can sort of sprint short distances plus 60 miles an hour so um, they're really ambushed predators. They need to get very close to their prey before they break their cover and they try and try and get to their prey. Any other reasons why their hunting success might not be as as good as they'd like it to be? Uh, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, the clue is us. Oh yeah, not a lot about not a lot of uh, land to honey in anymore. You know the, the habitat. We're stripping their, their territories of prey. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're building um, infrastructure through their, their territories, dams, and we're over farming the landscapes. We're hunting the same prey species of t as tigers eat. Um, in, I don't know if you watched any of that, um, was it Back Passage to India last night? It was a, a program first in a series that yes. was on and yeah. um, exploring, you know, um, trips through India. 1.2 billion people now living in India. Yeah. Not good news for large land predators like these. Competition now is, is really high. The tigers are starting to fight more and more over territory that's got prime prey. Um, one tiger in Siberia, for example, would be roaming a uh, size of land geographically the same, roughly the same in scale, uh, same scale as the Isle of Wight. Wow. And that's what one male tiger would need for uh, a sustainable um, year's prey. So it's, you know, obviously in Siberia the prey are scattered much further apart because the woodlands are much sparser. Um, in India it may be a territory maybe 20 square kilometres, you know, so it can, it can be a lot smaller. In any case, they don't eat as often as they'd like in the wild, but here we feed them little and often. They get one star feed where they cleanse their systems through. 
just drink water. Of course, we're best of friends when we're about to feed them. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really cupboard love. These ones I've raised since they were tiny. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Me first. You'll, you'll notice that the orangey one, she's called Zia, is the dominant one out right. of the two. She's older by six, six months. They are full sisters, same mum, same dad. They were put in together when this one was a year old and Zia was 18 months and they have got on really well. In the wild, they would not tolerate living together. Obviously, females would kill each other. They wouldn't go, go near each other's territories. And again, that's all to do with um, knowing that they have to live alone to, to hunt and survive. Um, so Steph and I are just going to put some meat in for them. What they got to eat, Steph? They have got horse meat, which is their staple diet at the zoo. Sorry for horse lovers here, but they do they do eat horse meat. It's their favourite food. Um, and uh, we have to get it brought over from the mainland, actually. We used to be able to pick up fallen stock on the island and pick up farmers uh, fallen stock. We're, we're not allowed to do it anymore, so we have to cart the meat over from the mainland. Um, it's all the restrictions that are, um, come about with DEFRAS at tightening up on Basically, it came down to us needing to establish a human consumption um, standard NACIAR facility. There's just no way that we could finance that. So, um, and even still, all the bones had to be taken and the offal had to be taken to the mainland because there's no incineration plant here to deal with that, which costs a lot of money. So now we just get the meat brought over and it's only the <coughs> bones that need to go back. There's no guts and intestines because yeah. we used to butcher everything on site. Um, which, from our point of view, is, is not as good because we used to get loads of really fresh food and lots of variety of diets. So now they tend to be more, tend to be more horse and beef. Um, the white lion caught a crow the other day, so they do still take a little bit of um, wild prey. But it's it's illegal to feed them anything live. Obviously, that's you know, in this country you can't do it. We wouldn't if you could. Um, so it's 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 everything that comes over and is frozen and then defrosted for them. So Steph and I work together in, in a pair and it's very necessary that we do work with the, the cats in this way because there's no room for error and human error working with these animals tends to be terminal yeah. so we're sort of coming out in a body bag which is <laughs> really, 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 be a good show but a great personal expense for us so we, we always work together um, even though I brought these tigers up since they were tiny, the, uh, the orange one came to me at Dale. She was literally hand-sized when she was given to me. Slept in my bed. Um, we used to take her in, in the sea for swims. She used to bathe with me. Um, so we have a very strong relationship. But if I went in with them, the chances are I would be killed quicker than you would be because they don't have any fear of me. So they would probably try and welcome me, run to me, knock me over, and the act of you know falling, and then they'd probably get overexcited. And it would probably be over very quickly. If you went in there, do you think that they might attack you and eat you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tasty. Well. Not risking it. <laughs> not risking it. No. Well, I'd put, put the money on them attacking you, but not the money on them eating you because they're well fed and they're not used to eating humans. You know, it's probably quite a, um, an acquired taste, really, human. We put lots of deodorants and synthetic scents on ourselves, which they probably don't like. We're quite salty, apparently. Um, a few hours? <laughs> 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 well, you know, I have friends in funny places. Um, so the humans probably not really on, on their agenda if they're living in a situation where they're getting fed often. Um, if they're in the wild, yes, they will start hunting and eating people if they don't have enough of their own prey to hunt. Um, but if you came in here, the, the chances are that the initial scenario would be that they would actually be very, very frightened. You know, they're quite used to you being here. That's, they're cool about that. But if you were suddenly in here, they'd be terrified. They'd be wondering, who are you? What are you going to do? They can't escape and they would know that they can't get away from you. So initially, they'd probably start backing away, but they'd be giving you some very preliminary, fierce warning signs that they were scared of you first thing that would happen is that their ears would clamp down onto their skull and that would give their face this rounded, very aggressive look. They'd be pulling up their upper lip and exposing their killing canine teeth. Their upper canines can, can reach sort of three, three to four inches long. Um, 
they would be growling at you, spitting at you and hissing at you. So all the things a domestic cat would do would just look, be looking a lot scarier. If you continue to walk towards them, then they may decide that they're going to launch up onto their hind legs to show you the full spectrum and scale of their bodies. And they can reach sort of 10 foot high when they're standing up on their hind legs. They'll be sort of looming over you with these massive forepaws that are like big boxing gloves, claws coming out, claws are sort of two to three inches long, waving them around. They probably start roaring at you at this point. You may have heard the lions roaring. Mm. And if you're at close range, you literally feel that shaking up yeah. through your body. So that would be a sort of a nappy moment, really, at that point. That, that's, <laughs> you know, Time to go. <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd be really feeling uncomfortable, I'm sure, in lots of ways by then. If you continue to walk towards them, what's within 12 to 14 feet, that's their very important flight distance. They won't let you come any closer. And if you back them into a corner, you're in big trouble. And that's when they're going to do one final thing as a plea to avoid conflict and ask you to go away. They're going to turn their ears around and show you those white markings that are on the backs of their ears. And that's really saying that if you don't get away now, you're going to have no choice but to launch an attack and kill you. If you stood your ground and you looked them in the eyes, you're, you're basically saying, you know, I want to fight you and that would be a wholly bad idea. Mm -hmm. The tiger would then launch itself on that distance onto your shoulders. <coughs> Obviously, that just the, the, the um, collision is going to send you falling to the ground. They're going to grab around your upper region with their claws, digging into your skin. They're going to hold you very still whilst they then select an area of soft tissue between two bones in the back of your neck. They're not going to plonk their canine teeth in anywhere along your spine. They're not stupid. If they snap a canine teeth or fracture it in any way, they can't hunt in the wild and they're solitary hunters. Their teeth have little, what we call Meccana receptors, nerves right on the tips and they allow the tooth to actually feel for the area to go through, prising the bones apart into spinal column. That's a brilliant technique for disabling prey because you're paralysed. You can't thrash around, kick them, injure them. Um, and then whilst you're in your death throes, without being too graphic and your nervous system shuts down, you'll be twitching around a bit, the tiger's whiskers will come down to form an umbrella on the surface of your skin. That detects any final movement so the tiger knows when it's safe to let go, go of you or if it's going to pull you under a bush and start consuming you. Unlikely, as I say, that it would probably just turn its nose up and walk away, to be honest, and wait for its meal to come tonight in this situation. So the yeah. whole thing would be a bit of a waste of your time. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> you'd be, you know, having been attacked, then you'd be dead. Yeah. You'd be dead? Yeah. 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 Well and truly. <laughs> you, you, you would be deader than dead. Absolutely dead. Yeah, they, 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 they're very effective killers, you know, when, as I say, once they get to the prey. Sometimes you go for sh you're strangling their prey, but an animal of our size, they'd probably go through uh, a, a neck bite. Mm -hmm. Probably best, though, that you would be killed by a tiger than a jaguar because they go for crushing head bite. Yeah, I'd rather be killed by a jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So their tongues are actually so rough, they can lick the hair off the meat and mm. make like the hair or. If we give them a chicken, they end up covered in feathers <laughs> and turkey. the <laughs> 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 Got exceptionally rough tongues, their tongues graze your skin yeah. as they lick you, and they obviously use their tongues to take the, um, the skin off their prey. Um, and they've got little tiny incisor teeth that are built in between their main canines. They normally have five to seven upper and lower between their canines, and they use them to pluck the, the um, fur and the feathers off their prey. So you'll see them, and they'll just be feathers everywhere in their mouth. <laughs> and unlike us, they have three sets of teeth in their lifetime and their um, adult teeth will grow up inside their juvenile teeth and push them out so that they have a formed tooth when their uh, juvenile canines come out, they've already got their adult teeth formed, it's no good being a toothless tiger, it doesn't really work. <laughs> So she should be over there eating, I suspect, so she 